you so much, Pastor. <clears throat> Good morning, everybody. Just want to remind you, I told the pastor that the size of the bottle determined the length of the sermon. I never saw one that small before, have you? <laughs> it is a joy to be here. My wife and I always enjoy coming to your church, appreciate your church, appreciate your support of our ministry and the goodness of God. On the table at the back, <clears throat> there is a copy of a newsletter, schedule card inside, hot off the press, okay? Uh, mailed out this week, special thanks to Cindy Noyes who takes care of that for us and uh, so on, but uh, back there, help yourself. We'd like you to take one, just the picture alone's worth the price, and uh, even if you don't want it, take it anyway, because we've got lots of them. But if the Lord should lay us upon your heart, pray for us, okay? Turn in your Bibles this morning, if you would please, to the New Testament, to the book of Hebrews and chapter 9. The book of Hebrews and chapter 9. Hebrews 9, I'm going to begin reading at verse number 11. But Christ being come and high priest of good things to come, by a greater and more perfect tabernacle not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building, neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood, he entered him once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. For if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of an heifer, sprinkling the unclean, sanctifieth to the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? For this cause, he's the mediator of the New Testament, that by means of death for the redemption of the transgressions that were under the First Testament, they which are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. <clears throat> For where a testament is, there must also of necessity be the death of the testator. For a testament is a force after men are dead. Otherwise, it is of no strength at all while the testator liveth. Whereupon neither the first testament was dedicated without blood. For when Moses had spoken every precept to all the people according to law, he took the blood of calves and goats, with water and scarlet wool and hyssop, sprinkled both the book and all the people, saying, This is the blood of the New Testament which God hath enjoined unto you. Moreover, he sprinkled with blood both the tabernacle and all the vessels of the ministry. And all things, almost all things, are by the law purged with blood. And without the shedding of blood, there is no remission. Great verses, Hebrews chapter 9, on the, one of the great subjects in the Word of God, the subject of the blood of Jesus Christ. Let's pause in just a word of prayer. Loving Father, we're so thankful for the opportunity of this morning to gather here, to share together, to open your Word. Lord, we need to hear from you. A lot of voices calling for our attention today. Help us to discern the still, small voice of our God. And Lord, may we not just be hearers. Help us to practice that which we hear. We'll thank you in Christ's name. Amen. In Leviticus chapter 17, especially verses 11 through 14, the Bible states two times this statement. The life is in the blood. The life is in the blood. So number one, the life is in the blood physically. So I just checked up a few facts with relation to the blood and our physical body. Because what I know medically, you could put on the head of a pin and have some room left over, but you can Google anything today, right? The circulatory system in your body and mind, now this, this baffles the mind. Medical people here will be familiar with it, but baffles the mind. But the entire circulatory system in our body, if it was to be stretched out in a line, would be over 66,000 miles. That's two and a half times the circumference of the earth. 
We had a doctor's appointment this past week, so I checked it out with my doctor. He said, you're totally accurate. Every time your heart beats or my heart beats, it expels approximately about two ounces of blood. And if you live to be 75 years of age, some of us, I should say some of you, no, some of us have made it. Some of us are not even close and aren't looking forward to it right yet, right? But if you live to be 75 years of age, your heart will have beat over two and one half billion times. That's expelling a lot of blood. Every second, three million red blood cells in your body die, only to be replaced from the bone marrow. Every second. Unbelievable. The average adult human body contains about 5.3 quarts of blood. And every day in the United States of America and Canada, about 43,000 pints of blood are used. So much for the few facts with relay. Is there any wonder in Psalm 139, the Bible says we are fearfully and wonderfully made? Marvelous are thy works. The life's in the blood. But you know what? That's physically. But you see, the life is also in the blood spiritually. On occasion, over the years, not many times, but a few times, matter of fact, someone said it to me in the last few months, I've had this statement said to me, sometimes sort of in jest, sometimes probably seriously, but I've had people say to me, man, you preach a bloody gospel. Well, folks, <coughs> there just ain't any other gospel. Poor grammar, but good theology. What does it say in the scripture I read in Hebrews? Almost all things are sprinkled with blood. And without the shedding of blood, there is no remission. There is no forgiveness. Ephesians 1.7, in whom we have redemption through his blood. The forgiveness of sin according to the riches of his grace. There are many, many hymns and songs that have been written on the subject of the blood of Christ. You definitely would not want me to sing, to sing any of them for you, so I just copied them off. But I will give you a line or two or a verse or two, and you're, many of you are familiar with them, okay? Here's one. I used to have this one as the ring on my cell phone. But when I got my new phone, I have a smartphone, but a dummy owns it. But uh, when I got my new phone, I couldn't get this one, so I have amazing grace on it. But I used to have this one on my phone. Are you washed in the blood? Okay. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Would you be free from your passion and pride? There's power in the blood. Would you or evil a victory win? There's power in the blood. There's power, power, wonder-working power in the blood, in the precious blood of the Lamb. And then this one. There is a fountain filled with blood and <clears throat> drawn from Emmanuel's veins, and sinners plunge beneath that flood lose all their guilty stain, lose all their guilty stain, lose all their guilty stain. And sinners plunge beneath that flood, lose all their guilty stain. The dying thief rejoiced to see that fountain in his day, and there may I, though vile as he, wash all my sins away. Wash all my sins away, wash all my sins away, and there may I, though vile as he, wash all my sins away. Are you, have you been to Jesus for the cleansing power? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? And then one that's been written a little more recently than these others, because the others that I've given are to the younger generation, ancient history. Uh, this one's been around for a while. But this one says, the blood that Jesus shed for me way back on Calvary, the blood that gives me strength from day to day, 
it will never lose its power. It soothes my doubts and calms my fears. It dries all my tears. The blood that gives me strength from day to day, it will never lose its power. The chorus says, it reaches to the highest mountain and it flows to the lowest valley. The blood that gives me strength from day to day, it will never lose its power. Title my message. I'll give you three guesses and the first two don't count. There is power in the blood. Three facts concerning the blood of Christ. Number one, the blood of Jesus is precious. 1 Peter 1, 18 and 19 says, We're not redeemed with corruptible things, such as silver and gold, received from vain tradition by the fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without spot and without blemish. The blood is precious. I looked up the word precious. Here's what it said. Of great price, of great value, costly, highly esteemed. That, my friend, is the blood of Jesus Christ. And we need to hear more about it. We need to place more emphasis upon it. Let me go back to the verse I quoted earlier. Ephesians 1, 7. In whom we have redemption through his blood. So the blood is precious. Number two, the blood's powerful. The blood in your body physically is powerful. You don't think so. Just let some impurities get in the bloodstream that aren't taken care of. And we'll have a special event for you. The blood is powerful. Let me tell you how powerful the blood of Jesus is. Number one, the blood of Jesus Christ is powerful enough to cleanse from every sin. No matter how bad a sinner you've been, or I've been, no matter how many sins I've committed, no matter how far I may have come short of the standard of Almighty God, the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses from all sin. 1 John 1, 7. If we walk in the light as he's in the light, we have fellowship one with the other, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, help me finish it, cleanses us from what? All sin. Okay, can we all say that? The blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us. That's pathetic. Okay, let's try it one more time. Okay, ready? Look at the person next to you. If they're not saying it, say, get with the program, please. Okay, here we go. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses from all sin. Secondly, I'll tell you how powerful it is. It not only cleanses from every sin, it claims every soul that it cleanses. Let me repeat that. It claims every soul that it cleanses. Here's the statement. Whatever the blood of Jesus Christ touches, it claims. You see, in the tabernacle, in the Old Testament, we studied the tabernacle during one of our spring sessions here at the church. The tabernacle of the Old Testament, every article of furniture in the tabernacle was sprinkled with blood. What was the very first item of furniture when you stepped through the, outer, the gate of the outer court? The brazen altar. What happened there? The animal was slain and the blood was shed, right? You cannot approach the presence of Almighty God apart from shed blood. But not only that, whatever the blood touches, it claims. Listen to 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20. What? Know you not, your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost which is in you, which you have of God. You're not your own. Here it is. For you are bought with a price. What's the price with which you're bought? The precious blood of Jesus Christ. You're not your own. You're bought with a price. Therefore, what am I to do? I'm to glorify God in my body and in my spirit, which are his. So that's how powerful the blood is. It's so powerful to cleanse from every sin. But secondly, it's powerful enough. It claims every soul that it cleanses. You're not your own. If you're saved today, by the way, if you're saved and you know it, say amen. amen. That was pretty good. Okay. Then you're not your own. So why are you trying to tell God what to do with what he purchased? Hands off. Not only that, he takes care of his property. He looks after his own. But there's a third truth about the power of the blood. 
not only power enough to cleanse from every sin, not only is it powerful enough that it claims every soul that it cleanses, listen to this, it's powerful enough it will conquer Satan in every situation that you ever face. Revelation chapter 12 and verse 11. Here's what it says. Talking about yet future, in reality, but it's present as well. They overcame him, and the him there is Satan, the god of this world, small g, prince of the power of the air, right? They overcame him, how? By the word of their testimony and by the blood of the Lamb. Aren't you glad that there is no force, there is no power, there's no principality, there's no being on heaven or earth that can stand against the power of the blood of Jesus Christ. And thank God, greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. So the blood is precious. The blood is powerful. But thirdly, the blood is purposeful. God didn't just send his son to shed his blood and to die without a significant purpose. And I want to share with you, if you thought I'm all done, no, I'm still on the introduction. I want to share with you a fourfold, there's more than that, but I want to share a fourfold purpose of the blood of Christ in your life and mine. Number one, I am basically purchased by the blood. I am purchased by the blood. He bought my soul through death at Calvary. Is it any wonder the songwriter said, there is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins, and sinners plunge beneath that flood, lose all their guilty stains. I have been purchased by the blood. In Acts chapter 20, the apostle Paul is planning to go to Ephesus. However, he needs to be in Jerusalem at a certain time period, so he doesn't have time to go to Ephesus. So he sends a message to the, I don't think he sent a text or an email or Twitter or whatever, okay? I don't think they had that in those days. But he got a message somehow to the elders and the leadership of the Ephesian church. He said, I don't have time to stop by now. I want to come later. However, he said, would you send the elders, the leadership of the church, over to Miletus because the ship is going to stop in that little seaport and I'd like to meet with you. So the leaders and the elders of the Ephesian church come over to Miletus and they meet with the Apostle Paul. And he gives them basically what is his farewell message to the church at Ephesus. And in Acts chapter 20, verse 24, Paul said to them, I want to finish my course with joy and the gospel of the grace of God. But then you get down to verse 28 of Acts chapter 20, and here's what he says. He said to them, the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers to feed the church of God. And then he made this statement, which he has purchased with his own blood. That's Acts 20, 28. He said to the leadership, the Holy Spirit has made you overseers of the church of God. You are to teach, you are to minister and he said, I want you to know something about this church. He purchased it with his own blood. I read a statement just recently of one of our present day, modern day preachers, quote, calls himself an evangelical. And uh, he said in that message, this statement, millennials, we have a lot of talk concerning millennials and God bless you. I think I was there in that age bracket one day, just can't remember when it was. But he said, millennials today are departing the church, but they're running to Jesus. That has got to be the most stupid, idiotic, ridiculous statement I've read in a long time. How under God's heaven do you depart that which Christ purchased with his own blood, which he willingly sacrificed his life and gave it up. No one takes it from me. I got power to lay it down, power to take it. How can you depart from that and then run to the very Savior who shed his blood to purchase that church? Sure doesn't make a lot of sense. 
You say, well, he might have been talking about the traditional church. No, he wasn't talking about the traditional church. So thank God, okay? One of the key purposes of the blood of Christ is that I'm a purchased person. In Ephesians 5, the Apostle Paul compares the church and the believer and Christ, the head of the church, to the marriage relationship, to the husband, the wife, etc. In Ephesians 5.25, here's what he says. Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. You want to know what's priority on the heart of my God? You want to know what's priority in the divine plan of my God, in his eternal purpose? The church. And the church is not the building. I mean, you have a beautiful facility. And by the way, I love the decorations. Okay, beautiful facility. And that's great. That's wonderful. But the church is the people. The church is a called out group of people, called out from the world unto Jesus Christ. So he purchased us with his own precious blood. Let's go to that verse in Ephesians 1 again, verse 7. In whom we have redemption. There's a key word. What does it mean to be purchased? I looked up the word redemption in a biblical dictionary, and here's the meaning. Redemption means to purchase by paying the ransom price. The purchase back of something that had been lost by the payment of a ransom. Listen to that again. The purchasing back of something that had been lost by paying the ransom price that's required. Quite often, you drive by places here in Maine, you see a sign that says Redemption Center. Okay? I love to go to those places. <laughs> okay? Not really. Redemption Center. It's where you can get rid of your cans and your bottles, etc., right? Well, God has a redemption center. It's called the cross. Paying the ransom price to purchase back something you once had but you lost. Question. What was it? Better question. Who was it that God had but he lost that he's purchasing back through the shed blood of Jesus Christ? It is you. It is I. You see, God created man in his own. I love what Dr. Vance Havner says. That Dr. Vance Havner says, in the first two chapters of the Bible, there's no devil. And in the last two chapters, there's no devil. He said, thank God for a book that does away with him. And that's so true. He's not in the first two. He's not in the last two. God took care of that. But listen, what happened? God created man in his own image. But God didn't make him a mechanical robot. God gave him a choice intellect, emotions, will. Man chose to go his way instead of God. So what happened? Sin came into the world. And the moment Adam sinned, he plunged the entire race into sin, as in Adam all die, so in Christ shall all be made alive. And the moment Adam sinned, in Genesis 3.15, we have the very first mention of the gospel in the word of God. I'll put enmity between thee and the woman, between thy seed and her seed, it shall bruise thy head and thou shalt bruise his heel. So what happened? God, in the person of Christ, is redeeming, repurchasing, buying back to himself a world that he lost through sin. Purpose of the blood. Number two, I'm not only purchased by the blood, I'm pardoned by the blood. Same verse, Ephesians 1, 7. In whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sin. The word forgiveness and the word remission are exactly the same. I looked up the word remission. Here's what it said. Forgiveness, exemption from the consequences of an offense. Isn't it great to know that because of the blood of Jesus Christ, you and I can be exempt from the consequences of sin. What is or what are the consequences of sin? For the wages of the penalty of sin, Romans 6, 23, is what? Death. Now, there are three types of death. Physical death, spiritual death, and eternal death. Physical death is the separation of the soul from the body. Spiritual death is the separation of the soul from God. Eternal death is the separation of the soul from God forever. 
And so because of his precious shed blood, see there's power in the blood. And because of his shed blood, I can have remission. I can have forgiveness. Great illustration of this in Leviticus and chapter 8. In Leviticus chapter 8, they brought two animals, two goats. The priest brought them. One was sacrificed and killed. The blood was shed. That's necessary. The second goat was kept alive. This goat was called the scape goat, S-C-A-P-E, goat, okay? What happened was Aaron and the priesthood would lay their hands upon the head of this goat. They would confess their own sin and the sin of the people. Then they would take that animal, the live animal, send it off into the wilderness, never to return again. <laughs> What's the Bible say that God's done with your sin and mine? He's removed it as far as the what? The east is from the west. How far is that? Can't measure it. What else has he done? He's buried it where? In the depths of the deepest sea. And old Billy Sunday said, if the devil tries to go down and dig them up, God will drown him. There's a song said he posted a no fishing sign, right? So thank God for the purpose of the blood. I've been purchased by the blood. I've been pardoned and forgiven by the blood. I've got redemption. I've got remission. But thirdly, I'm also purified by the blood. You see, the greatest cleanser in all the world is not put out by Procter & Gamble. See, the greatest cleanser in all the world is the blood in the book. I've been made safe by the blood. I'm made sure by the book. I've been cleansed by the blood of Christ. I'm kept clean by the word, John 15, 3. Now you are clean through the word which I've spoken of you. Psalm 119, 9. Wherewithal shall a young person put any age in you want? Cleanse his or her way, here it is, by taking heed thereto according to thy word. But you see, not only was I cleansed initially by the blood, thank God for the cleansing power of the blood of Christ every day in my life on an ongoing basis. Matthew 5, 8. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. So you see, the blood's not only precious. The blood's not only powerful. The blood's purposeful. The blood of Jesus Christ is of utmost significance. What are they? Well, he purchased me by the blood. He pardoned me by the blood. He purified me by the blood. And I better get to the fourth one because I see the hands on the clock just keep going around. Hate clocks in church. Now, just kidding. Okay, the fourth one. This is the one I emphasized way back at the beginning. Remember I made this statement, whatever the blood touches, it what? It claims, it owns. So you see, I'm not only purchased, pardoned, and purified by the blood, I'm possessed by the blood. That's one of the great truths of the blood of Jesus Christ. And you want a great illustration of this? By the way, I gave you the wrong chapter uh, in Leviticus on the other one. The other one was Leviticus 16. This one's Leviticus 8, okay? In Leviticus chapter 8, in the dedication and the consecration of the priests, they took an animal, they slew the animal, then they took that shed blood, and they placed that blood, three parts of the human body of the priest in dedication and consecration to God. Remember, we're not our own. We've been bought with a price. What three parts of the body did they place that blood? Well, they placed it on the tip of the right ear. They placed it on the thumb of the right hand. And they placed it on the big toe of the right foot. God's a right winger all the way. Okay? The right ear, the right hand, the right foot. Now, what does the ear speak of? It's my reception, right? Jesus said several times to his disciples, he that hath ears to hear, what? Let him hear. You know it's possible to have good hearing, not hear anything? Do you know it's possible to be here in this entire service this morning, not hear a thing going on? You say, yep, I haven't heard you yet. No, it is, isn't it? It's possible to be there in a mind somewhere else, right? So he that hath ears to hear, what do I need? I need the blood of Christ on the ear so that my words that I hear are honoring, glorifying, uplifting to him. Secondly, 
They put the blood on the thumb of the hand. That speaks of my work. That speaks of my labor. Hands that were pierced for me, for my sin. But I can have those hands open to give, those hands available to help, those hands available to serve, and those hands available to be used for the honor and glory of Almighty God. Then, put it on the big toe of the right foot. So I've got my words, I've got my work, now I've got my walk. So every step you and I take in this old world, we need feet that are cleansed by the precious blood of Christ. That's why Psalm 37, 23 says, the steps of a good person are ordered by the Lord, and he, God, delights in his way. That means that you and I can actually bring delight to the heart of Almighty God when we walk in obedience to his word, when we listen to what he has to say, when we're willing to do what he wants us to do and to go where he wants us to go, possessed by the blood. Listen to this statement. Jesus gave himself for us so he could give himself to us so he could work in and through us to the lives of others. I repeat that one more time. Jesus gave himself for us so that he could give himself to us, so he could work in and through us to the lives of others. There's power in the blood. Question, have you been to Jesus for the cleansing power. Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Father, how we thank you for your word. Thank you that faith comes by hearing. Hearing comes by the word of God. Thank you, Lord, that this prophecy didn't come by the will of man. Holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. Spirit of a living God, fall fresh on us. With every head bowed, just before I turn it back to your pastor, I know that many of us, most of us, perhaps even all of us, have had a day and a time and a place when we've placed our faith and trust in Jesus Christ, His death, His shed blood, His burial, his resurrection as the only atonement for sin. If you have, amen. If you haven't, do it today. Do it today. Only through a personal relationship with Christ can you have an access to Almighty God. And then, Christian, are we allowing the blood of Christ to control that which I hear and receive in my words? Am I allowing it to control those hands and my work? Am I allowing it to control my feet and my walk so that my life will be a testimony of the saving power of the blood of Christ? There is power in the blood. Father, Seal to our hearts the truth of your word. We love you in Jesus' name. And all God's people said,